Hi, everyone. Welcome to Mary's Cup of Tea, the podcast. Today, I am joined by a guest that I am totally freaking out and fangirling about because I've been listening to her podcast for so long. I am here with Cara Lowenthal. Cara, welcome. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for taking the time. Like I said, I've been listening to your podcast for so long and you have so many wise words to share about a wide variety of topics that we'll get into. But before we do that, I just want to read your bio for those who may be unfamiliar with you. Uh, Cara Lowenthal is a master certified coach with a BA from Yale and a JD from Harvard Law. In the last three years after pivoting from a legal career, she has grown her life coaching business from zero to seven figures. Yes. Uh, she's the host of the iTunes top rated self-help podcast called Unfuck Your Brain, which has been downloaded over 10 million times. The big M is million. Oh my big God. M is million. Yeah. 10 million times. 10 million times. Oh my gosh. I mean, rightfully so. It, it yeah, better, obviously. <laughs> it better be like 10 million and however many people listen to this podcast. I don't know. It might be just like a hundred of you listening to a lot to the episodes over and over again. Also possible. Half of those are probably <laughs> my friends. <laughs> um, and you've been featured in outlets like Marie Claire, Mind Body Green, MSN.com, The Huffington Post. You live in New York and we can learn more about you at at unfuckyourbrain.com. Um, and also your podcast is also called Unfuck Your Brain, which is genius. Out of curiosity, how did you land on that? Um, I was at a, did a like one day kind of business retreat with a coach. And um, we were, we were kind of, I was transitioning from coaching lawyers and I had been like coaching women lawyers, but then also doing body image coaching and dating coaching. I just like kept doing different things. And mm -hmm. when we put it all together, I said like, Basically, I'm helping women with a lot of anxiety, like fix the way that the patriarchy fucks up their brain. So then unfuck your brain kind of seemed like the obvious. Mm, I love that. Yeah. And like, there's no better word for it. I mean, like we can tiptoe around it all we want. I think I heard in one of your episodes where iTunes wouldn't let the full word and that's why there's an asterisk. Oh yeah. That's why we have an asterisk. Yeah. Also Facebook doesn't like it. Like that's why we... We have an asterisk, mm. but now I kind of feel like that's the cooler way. Like spelling it out is so passe, you know? <laughs> For sure. I love it. It slides, but it's there. Um, I'm curious, like what was this journey going from uh, being a lawyer to a coach? What what led you to this? Um, I, <laughs> there's like the very, <laughs> there's like the very long version and the short version. Um, I mean, I think I was always interested in psychology and self-help and self-development and like you know, when I was 16, I told my parents that I wanted to go to therapy. Like I was like, you know, I think yeah. there's got to, I want some coping tools and skills. There's got to be a better way to be a human. Um, so I think I was always interested in that work, but I didn't, I considered like majoring in psychology in college, but it's hard to even remember like why, we, why I made the decisions I did back then. I think the psychology department at Yale when I was there was kind of in a kerfuffle, like people had left. It just was like kind of disorganized. And so you like what didn't seem like the best time to major in it and then I was in did a lot of was doing a lot of feminist activism and so I kind of went that route um but I didn't I didn't like set out to be a life coach I just was interested in the work and hired coaches myself and I found my teacher's work and was applying it to myself and it really changed my life and then after a year of that I kind of like woke up one day and just knew that this is what I wanted to do but I mean I think that I had never I didn't ever really feel like being a lawyer or a law professor was the epitome of what I wanted to do with my life. I cared a lot about feminist issues and these were, this was like the tools to work on them in the world that I was in. And, you know, but I, I know, I mean, I felt like I looked around and my fellow academics, the ones who really were meant to be academics, mm -hmm. they were like in love with their work and waking up thinking about their ideas. And like, I, it's like people are always asking me where I get my ideas and like what are all the books I've read and like yeah I do read a lot of books but I'm just not fundamentally a researcher I'm like fundamentally an observer of my own and other people mm -hmm. I'm a very close observer of myself and other humans and mm -hmm. I do have education and background in my work that I do obviously but I'm just not someone who's like all I want to do is read 600 research articles on this one aspect of cognitive behavioral therapy and like that's what yeah. you need to be to be an academic but right. it's law or anything else. So it just sort of, it just like coalesced in my brain. And then I woke up one day and was mm -hmm. like, might as well blow up my whole life. Let's do this thing. <laughs> I love it. And, and I that's really, what I did. <laughs> I really, really relate to that. I think I speak for many when I say you are a godsend to me because um, 
I like you were always was always interested in life coaching and I've been I would say doing the work since I was probably about 16 as well just in in different ways um but one thing that I've always seen lacking in the space is that it's very um masculine and like capitalist and all about performing and working mm -hmm. and hustle and grind and so much of it does not that it doesn't apply to women but it just doesn't relate mm -hmm. um and so when you speak from your experience it just it really like everything you even just said that so lands with me and it really shows up and when you speak on the podcast like you bring in so many different ideas that like you said it's not like one book you read it from it's just this like life of observing and experiencing like I, I was just listening to your podcast and you were talking about theology and how Christian theology differs from this and it just goes so many mm -hmm. di different directions and to me I get excited about that because it shows us how everything is so connected and how we can learn something from literally everything and that's what I love the most about you and your podcast and and your work in general um, is that it's refreshing and new but also logical and applicable. I think that's a vote of confidence for like a liberal education, right? Like it's sort of like, um, what's the right word? I mean, yes, there are a lot of ways that I think college has been pushed as the answer for everyone that doesn't make mm -hmm. sense. Like we have a bunch of unemployed people and no plumbers, like that doesn't really make sense. And right, it's not the, it's not the path, like a college degree isn't the end all and be all and it's not the path to the middle class that it used to be and not everybody should go to college. But it's also not the case that like, I think it also sometimes has become kind of fashionable to think that like I, you know the humanities just like fall out of favor and it's like everybody should be a computer software engineer or whatever like mm -hmm. but everything you're talking about like all, all that comes from just having had a good liberal arts education right from having mm -hmm. like read a bunch of books and studied a bunch of things and having all of that in my brain in the mix so mm -hmm. you know I do think that's like part of the part of the problem with living in a world where we only consume like I like it's just like me my crotchety old version of me but I'm like people don't read enough like mm -hmm. living in a world where like everything we consume is kind of like contemporary and mm -hmm. and sort of entertainment and and already tailored by the algorithm to what we already like and know mm -hmm. you know I just think I think we like miss some of the depth that you get from um from like studying it. other periods I mean I think one of the reasons that my coaching one of the best things about my work is that it has some I, I am not a historian. I have like a, I don't have like an in-depth understanding of history. I just have a like, if you're educated <laughs> level of history, but so many people don't study history at all or like our, you know, the yeah. textbooks and like the modern American educational system are all screwed up and biased and they don't really cover history the way they should. And so mm -hmm. we like lack the context to understand the ways in which our brains evolved and the ways mm -hmm. in which like the things that we experience like feeling like it really matters that, you know, everybody like us or like the way that we experience our romantic relationships or whatever else, that everything is so um, socially conditioned and is like, you know, yeah. what we think is beautiful or what we think is good or what we think you should be doing with your life or whatever else are not just like truths from the universe. You need historical perspective to help you see that. Yeah. And context. I really, really appreciate that word. Um, because exactly, it's all comes from so many different places, just even something as simple as like a beauty standard, like there's religion, there's the patriarchy, there's society, yeah. there's different movements happening all at once, and they're all so interconnected. And I think that can be overwhelming for some, but you very much simplify it. Even uh, the podcast you did recently about RBG, um, May She Rest in Peace, and you were talking about how there's so many things that we take for granted um, that regardless of if you like her, if you don't completely approve of her, um, there's so many things that she has contributed. Right. And, and that's the lack of the historical understanding. Like there yeah. are people out there being like, you know, at their jobs that they're only allowed to have because of the work she did with the credit card in their name that they only have because of the work she did, yeah. like posting on Facebook about how they hate her. And like, okay, fine. But you would be at home not able yeah. to own property yourself without a bank account in your name, not yeah. at that job after you had a baby because they would have fired you mm -hmm. if not for the work that she did. Like we are, yeah, it's, it feels like, I mean, 2020, especially because it's 2020, but even so it just feels like our, like America is such a young country and we don't really prize historical consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so I think like if you're in a society that's thousands of years old, what happened 50 years ago still seems very new and present and everybody knows about it. Yeah. And in America, we're like, 2012 I mean 
that's like the Romans. Like who could possibly know what happened back then? I know. I've kind of buried that year deep. I think in 2012, I was in middle <laughs> school and that was horrible. <laughs> oh, that is horrifying. Wait, 2002, how old are you? I'm 22, Cara. I'm oh 22. my God, you are a, ch- a baby. You are a I know. baby. Oh my God, I didn't realize how young you were. Because I was like, in 2012, I was definitely already working and adult. Yeah. Wow. No, I'm young. And I, I really like hearing that. I used to hate when people are like, oh my God, you're so young. But I, I actually really like it now. I've learned precocious. Yeah, thank you. Um, So tell us about how you define, you personally define feminism, how you talk about it in the context of unfucking your brain, aka retraining your brain, um, and why this is so important for us to have a feminist perspective and to be aware of the patriarchy as we're doing work like thought work or life coaching work. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, um, so, I mean, everybody, I was about to say everybody's their own definition, but that's not really true because feminism is a particular political and social movement, right? So there's some, you know, there's some, I think there's people who try to use feminism as meaning like women should just always support other women. And I'm like, well, you know, no, if you're trying to pass a law that I can't get birth control, I'm not going to be in support of you just because you also have ovaries, right? Like, so I think that feminism is the political and social and cultural movement towards not just men and women, because there are people who don't identify as either, people of any gender identity, people of any sexual orientation, just all humans having, right, access to the same set of rights and opportunities and not being, um, certainly not legally, as like there's the legal version of feminism, but even culturally, like not being, having nothing be predetermined or predecided about you or who and who you're supposed to be and what you're able to do and what your capabilities are and what kind of life you should have and what your value is and any of that like how, you know i think feminism historically has been like about has operated in these versions of like men and women because that mm-hmm. you know we have a limited gender consciousness for much of humanity and because men have always been the default right and people people identified as women have been the kind of more oppressed class compared to that but really i think it goes beyond that it's just Mm -hmm. but certainly that being a woman itself should not be a hindrance to you in any way socially politically legally culturally like we should all have the same value right and the same Mm -hmm. opportunities and the same access to the good life yeah one one thing that comes up is like Right now in 2020, um, I wouldn't say we have full equality and equity, um, but they're more or less, it's better, better than we've ever had, right? And so when we talk about feminism, the kind of thing that we get from a lot of non-feminists or people who don't understand it completely is like, well, we are equal. It's your fault if you don't act on those opportunities. Um, and one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately, which I'm sure I've learned from from your podcast in one way or another, is that even though you can technically do something, like the example that pops into my mind is like, like reply with a, a one word response and a period mm-hmm. at the end and not an exclamation point or say how you feel mm-hmm. um, without being worried of coming across as bitchy or too assertive. Even though like, yeah, you can do that. There are these social consequences and social forces that still don't let us do that. Um, and that's something that I've been grappling with a lot, especially when I'm you know, promoting a certain message on social media. I think I did something about body hair. Like, yeah, even though you can te- technically not shave your legs, there are social consequences that come with that. So how, how do you apply thought work to those kinds of nuances? Well, I think that we, in general, I think the rule is that we only care what other people think when we have that same thought, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't worry about the social consequences of someone thinking I'm too smart. I am sure there are some. I'm sure I have gone on dates or like guys have seen my profiles or whatever and been like, I mean, I don't know if they know that that's what they're doing, right? But just been Mm -hmm. like, oh, intimidating or like she's going to be whatever. Or like, I didn't like that she told Mm -hmm. me that my like chain of reasoning was wrong on the date or (laughs) whatever it is. But like, I spend zero amount of time worrying about that, right? Because being smart is something that I value about myself. Mm. Just like anybody who is like, I don't like you because you're too feminist. I would be like, you're, I don't know what, I don't understand what you're saying, but like, fine, you're lost, right? Like, because I value that about myself. So 
this or if, if, if somebody was like i mean even to make it a physical characteristic right if somebody was like well i don't like brunettes i'm not like oh my god maybe i should be a blonde right i'm just <laughs> like okay well you're lost fine go find a blonde right because i like being a brunette it's the things that we still have some internalized shame or fear about and so a lot of the ways a lot of the time what's happening i think is women are trying to break out of like socialized stuff about how they're, they're what their appearance norms are supposed to be or how they're supposed to act but they don't fully believe it yet because they don't know thought work, which is the beauty of thought work. They don't actually know how to change their thoughts. So the way that I describe it is like, if you don't know how to actually change your thinking, which is what I teach, then what you're doing is you have the social society taught you your baseline belief before you knew about feminism, which was like, women should shave their legs. You see ads about it all the time. You don't see women around you with the hair on their legs. You hear your mom say like, oh, really? I really have to, I don't, whatever. Like you get all this, right? Nobody sits you down to be like, I mean, maybe they do, but like, it's not really, it's not like you get a memo, but you just yeah. absorb it from society. So that's all the bedrock. You have that thought. Okay. Now you're 21 and you have learned about feminism and you're like, well, this is fucked up. Why do I have to do this bullshit? Right. I don't want to have to do this. Like I want to be someone who doesn't care if, who doesn't shave for life and feels good about it. But if you don't know how to actually change the baseline thought you have through cognitive change strategies, which is the work that I teach, then all you're doing is just layering one thought on top of another and they're in conflict. Mm. You still believe the first one. And then now you're trying to believe the second one, but you don't really have the tools to do that. So what you experience is kind of going back, rocking back and forth between the two thoughts and it's very fragile. So yeah. You might like, you're, you have like this tenuous grip on the new belief you want to have about how it's awesome to not shave your legs, but because you haven't actually done any work and you don't know how to excavate and change the original belief, the minute mm -hmm. that somebody gives you any feedback that, you know, the minute someone's like, ew, you don't shave your legs or like whatever, mm -hmm. you immediately, it's like you lose your grasp on that new thought and you're right back in the old one. Mm. Oh, that just messed me up. And that even causes more anxiety because that's when you're like, I should, shouldn't be right. Doing then you're shooting yourself all over the place. But the truth is like changing your thoughts is just, it's like playing the harmonica. Like it's a skill that you have to learn. It's not a like, I mean, it, it's not like the harmonica in any other way, but I just mean like something that you would never expect you should intuitively be able to do. Right. Yeah. I would never look or like, an, I would never look at an accordion and be like, what the fuck is wrong with me that I don't know how to play that. Like I really should know how. <laughs> But, right. So actually literally changing your thinking on purpose is a skill that most people aren't never learn. that for some reason we don't teach in school. You have to learn how to do it. So, but we don't know that we just are like, oh, I'm a bad feminist or like, I'm so shallow. I can't believe I care about this. And, or, you know, I don't, I shouldn't, or I, we get, we make all this drama about it. We make it mean something about us as a person or as a feminist or whatever else. It doesn't mean anything about you. You're just literally missing the skill. You just have never mm -hmm. learned it of actually changing that underlying thought to truly believe the new thought, not just to try to like, you know, plaster over a hole in the wall and like hope that, yeah. you know, there's no more leaking in there. Like there's going to be, it's going to collapse because mm -hmm. you don't know how to actually like fill in the hole and build it. Yeah. The, the imagery that comes to mind and the one I, I've used before is kind of like, like you said, if somebody's like, you're too smart, you're like, oh, whatever, because it's not an open wound. It's like, if right, somebody right. just poured salt on your hand, you're like, whatever. Um, but if you had a cut there and somebody poured mm -hmm. salt in it, then it hurts. Yeah. Um, Anything you believe about yourself to be bad or that you're worried is bad. It's always just a reflection of what you believe about yourself that you haven't resolved yet. And that's why all of our, anytime we get triggered by something someone says, it's always comes down to retraining our brain. Yeah. hundred percent. So an ex going with that example of shaving your legs, how, how would you apply thought work to that? Well, you have to, I mean, this is what's so wild about patriarchy is so much of our thought process that we absorb is not, again, it's not done explicitly. Nobody like sits you down with the memo. So first you have to figure out what are all your associations? Cause it's the truth is you don't just have one thought like women should shave their legs. You have like a ton of associations with it that you don't even know about. Like women shouldn't be hairy. It's disgusting. Men won't like it. It means you've let yourself go. Oh, you look like a man or you look like a animal or who knows? Like, right? like there's some that like, I can guess most women would have because of what we're all taught. And then there's going to be like some weird associations and thoughts that just each individual person has based on mm -hmm. whatever, like the memory of being teased for not shaving their legs in eighth grade or something, you know, like people are going to have their own individual stuff. And then there's going to be all the stuff we all learn from society all of that is underlaying this one little thought of like, 
whether you shave your legs or not. So in order to change it, you have to first dig out all of that stuff, like do a kind of what we call a thought download, which is like, get all your thoughts out so you can see Mm -hmm. all of it, which I, you know, sometimes I think when we're judging ourselves, then we, we find that overwhelming and we're like, look at all those thoughts. But to me, it's always like, oh, well, no wonder I feel all fucked up about something that should, that seems simple on the surface. Look at all this stuff I'm thinking. I have 16 thoughts about this. Like, of course I feel crazy. And, you know, that now I understand why I'm feeling this way. And then um, I go into more detail about this on the podcast, obviously, but I teach a technique for, called the thought ladder for like identifying your current thought, identifying the thought you want to believe, which might be like, Mm -hmm. like not having hairy legs is super sexy. Like maybe that's the thought you want to believe, but you Mm -hmm. don't believe that yet. And then identifying kind of rungs on the ladder, which are like little step thoughts you can take, like little baby step thoughts. Like Mm -hmm. it's possible for someone to be sexy even with hair on their legs, or it's possible that shaving my legs isn't the only thing that makes me sexy or not. Or Right. And those are just two examples, but, and there's a lot of different techniques for coming up with these ladder thoughts, but basically you're moving, you're bit by bit repatterning your brain rather than creating all that cognitive dissonance of believing that it's gross and unfeminine and then trying to tell yourself that it's super cool and having this chasm between them and not really being able to believe either one fully. Oh my God, my brain is exploding. (laughs) So it's it's basically like meeting yourself halfway. I think what mm-hmm. I'm, yeah, or like ninety percent of the way. Like we're just yeah. going for like a tiny baby step. I always say like the new thought won't even feel good. It'll just feel like slightly less bad than the original yeah. thought, and then we're gonna like move our way to neutral, and then we're gonna worry about moving to positive. I've heard you say that before. It'll just be slightly less yeah, bad. Yeah, Jewish approach to thought work. We're just yeah. like a little less bad. That's what we're oh, doing that's here. That's fantastic. That is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Fantastic. The part that that really landed like scientifically, because everything that you do is so scientifically backed. Um, even if if we don't realize that there's a lot of, of research that goes into mm-hmm. re- reprogramming all of this and how oh. we can. So when you said cognitive dissonance, it's like, yeah, that is a prime example of cognitive dissonance when like, and this is why so many people still slide in my DMs and they're like, how do I feel better about my body? And I'm like, literally every single post is about this, but it's that dis- Mm -hmm. where it doesn't matter how many times I tell them that their their body is great the way it is. Um, If they don't do that, take those steps. And like you said, build that skill, then it's just going to feel like another thing that you're failing at. Right. And people have unrealistic expectations, right? This is why I stress so much. It's not going to feel good. It's just going to feel slightly less bad. It's like people are like, I, they think they're still looking for like that thing that's going to make them feel good, right? Mm-hmm. They're like, maybe if she said it in another way, it would just click in this way where I will just feel good, right? There's something else I'm missing. Like whenever I have my, whenever my students, like they'll, we have, um, I have this feminist um, coaching membership called The Clutch and we have a Facebook mm-hmm. group and lots of other kind of ways to get coaching from coaches and me, but you can also like coach each other. Mm-hmm. And so and people will, my clients will want to like, basically post a whole mess of thoughts and then just be like, it's just so much. I don't know where to start. And I'm always like literally the same thing. Every time the way you start is you take one thought out of that and then you do a thought ladder and then you find a slightly better thought to think, right? We don't, we're not, I mean, it's both that just humans want instant gratification and that's what we're kind of taught. Right. But also we just have never experienced it. Like most of us, when we have changed our minds in the past or something has changed for us mentally, we didn't do it on purpose. It happened by accident. So it mm-hmm. seems like it's just kind of magic. Like it just happened and then we felt better and we don't really know like what's behind the curtain. And mm-hmm. so we think that's how it's supposed to happen. And so then we're like, oh, I just haven't found the right thing. So let me DM Mary, let me DM Cara. Like maybe somebody can tell me the thing that's yeah. gonna make that happen. But that's not what, when you have changed, like when something has been different in the, when your brain has changed in the past, it seemed magical to you actually these little incremental things were happening unconsciously and we're just now trying to teach you how to make them conscious. Mm-hmm. So yeah, like you can, you can passively consume all the body positivity you want. And it's probably, I mean, I'm not gonna say it won't do anything. There will be some effect of osmosis over a long period of time, simply because the more you hear something, the more you think it. So you're kind of unconsciously practicing the thought mm-hmm. a little bit, but that is like the very, very slow train. And yeah. if you actually want to change it, you have to, ironically be willing to like go slow and right. do it on purpose piece by piece yeah there's nothing you can say or i can say 
what are we saying that somebody hasn't heard before in terms of like, right. <laughs> what's good about your body? Like you've heard it before, but you're just wanting, hearing it to do the work as opposed to like sitting down, looking at your thoughts, picking a thought mm -hmm. to practice and then putting in the time and the work to practice it. Right. Which is kind of unsexy. You make it sexy. Yeah. It's it? no, it's not sexy. It's fucking <laughs> annoying and horrible. I too wish <laughs> that I could just identify what I want to believe and then just like push three buttons and that was it. But that's yeah. just not how the brain works. You do get better at it over time because it's like a skill. Believing something new on purpose is a skill you can learn. Mm -hmm. But just like you want, you know, <laughs> it's like my students sometimes will be like, I've been practicing this thought for two weeks. I'm like, you imagine Yo-Yo Ma being like, can you imagine <laughs> practicing the cello for two weeks and being like, I haven't been invited to Carnegie Hall yet. Why, why yeah. don't I sound like Yo-Yo Ma? Like that shit takes time. Yeah. Yeah. And it's the work that you do in that time right. as well. Um, the time and the practice, just like with anything, uh, for sure. Um, and like you said, so many of these things, it's like part of it is osmosis. Well, the, these the things that we do and the things that we absorb, sometimes we don't see the all the work it took and the whole evolution yeah, until we get a result. And then we're like, I don't even remember how I got this result. Mm -hmm. um, but really it always comes down to thought work, like you said, whether it's consciously or subconsciously. Yeah. And if you leave it to your subconscious, like who knows, it might come up with something good or it might come up with something terrible. And given that it's been programmed by society, most of the time it's going to come up with something terrible. So it's really much better yeah. if you do it on purpose. <laughs> I bet to that. Um, you recently released a podcast episode about um, fat phobia, internalized fat phobia mm -hmm. specifically, and body image. And a lot of my listeners are struggling with body image and their own internalized fat phobia and their thoughts and beliefs about what what's what we should look like, what women should look like, what they mm -hmm. should look like. Like, um, what has that journey been like for you personally, if you're comfortable sharing? Um, and what what micro thoughts, I guess, have helped mm -hmm. you the most? Yeah, well, clearly I have no filter and I share everything. And I just shared it on my own entire enormous podcast. So, so And I want people about. to listen to the whole podcast. It was a longer one, too. It was 30 minutes. It was 30 minutes, yeah. Sometimes yeah. I just really get rolling. <laughs> <laughs> when you do interviews, it's easy to get to an hour. When you're just talking by yourself after 20 minutes, you're like, this is enough. It's time to yeah, stop. Yeah. But it's perfect. It's digestible. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I don't have my attention span. Is, um, <laughs> so, uh, well, just so people understand, people, a lot of, so fat phobia would be the fear, right, of fat, which is, that's the simplest definition, right? But it's like ageism or racism or anything else. Some people call it sizeism, but it's like an entire social structure right? That is based on marginalizing people based on their body size. And so just like I teach that, like, if you live in a white supremacist society, which we do, we've all internalized racism. Same is true of fat phobia and sizeism, right? We live in a society that is like obsessed with thinness and with demonizing and um, marginalizing fat people. And so we've all absorbed that. The reason you hate your body, yes, it's patriarchy, but it's a fat phobic patriarchy right? Mm -hmm. Otherwise we could have the opposite. We could have like a thin phobic patriarchy where everybody would hate themselves for being not fat enough, right? <laughs> like Which we've had before. Totally, right. Changes yeah. over time, right? But so it is the patri patriarchy is the part that makes a woman, teaches women to associate their value with their body. But mm -hmm. fat phobia is the part that in our current society makes that ideal mm. be being thin, right? So it's sort of, it's two, this is when we talk about like intersectional feminism, right? It gets talked about often in the context of race and patriarchy, and it was coined by black feminists. That is the origination, but it is certainly, it, it's applicable to other marginalizations, right? Being, um, you know, with people living with a disability or ageism or whatever else, like you get two or more intersecting systems of oppression. Mm -hmm. right? That's why it's called intersectionality. So, and the, and the studies sort of bear that out, like you know, there's a negative consequence in the job market if you're a fat man, but there's a bigger negative consequence if you're a fat woman. If you're a fat woman who's also a little bit of color, there's even bigger consequence, right? It's like each time you layer on another marginalized identity, there's a, a bigger and bigger kind of social consequence or, or message in the society. Um, so what I talk about on my podcast, kind of one of the big differences for me in this work was that when I... I've been a feminist since I can remember, and I never remember having any conf conflict about that at all. I was just always like, you know, writing angry feminist editorials in my high school newspaper. Like I just was never, I for sure had a lot of conflict around, so, like I had plenty of mental cognitive dissonance around my internalized sexism in terms of like, 
thinking women should be able to be loud and proud and then also secretly worrying that I was too much or whatever, right? Like, I'm not saying I didn't have any of that, but I just, even when I discovered this work, I was already aware of that distinction. Like, okay, I could, I already could see, I believe these things, but then I, you know, I'm also worried about these things about myself that I don't think I should be worried about because of feminism, Mm -hmm. but I am. I was aware of all that. I was not at all aware of fat phobia. I was completely captured by the ideology. I just totally thought that being fat was bad and being thin was good and attractive. You know, I was just like a hundred percent. I don't understand the matrix enough to talk about the red pill or the blue pill or whatever. Also, I think that's being used by like Reddit white supremacists now, but I don't know what the right metaphor is, but I was like, I was just totally in it. I just had no awareness that there was a different way to think or that, you know, uh, that I was kind of, had been that this that this was an ideology rather than just yeah. the truth about the world which so, is often a sign of the internalization yeah like, totally so right the, and and so many of people do right i mean it's mm-hmm. when you do this work day in and day out like you and i do it's easy to forget that like there are people out there who i you know i <laughs> i did a podcast with my coach and teacher Brooke Castillo on her podcast in like December 2018 maybe about body image and I mm-hmm. I like very and to me it's like of course we're all thinking and talking about this and we know these things and I remember one a coach somebody in who was like in coach training somebody who was one of my colleagues who was teaching coach training reaching out to me and being like I just want you to know I had a student a coach in training cry in our session today because this was the first time that anyone had ever told her she the first time she'd ever heard that she could just love herself at her current weight like we're so used to it we talk about it all the time we're interacting with people on instagram or wherever who are at least thinking about it and we just don't realize like there's so many people out there who haven't heard this message at all who are still completely in it Mm -hmm. so this was the for one of the first big areas i worked on and i totally use those latter thoughts because part of what I teach and feel really strongly about is that a lot of the, when we are trying to kind of change our own thoughts or coach ourselves and a lot of talk therapy sometimes operates in this way too, we're trying to address a problem at a level of abstraction that the human brain really can't cope with. Mm -hmm. So we're just like, when people are like, well, how do I like raise my self-esteem? I'm like, nobody knows. That's not a thing we know (laughs) how to do. You have to, I mean, we can, I can for sure help you feel better about yourself, but we're not going to like, we're not going to like operate directly on your self-esteem. You guys on the podcast (laughs) can't see, but I'm making little like operating motions with my hand. Like (laughs) that's like, it's like, that's like a global diagnosis, right? Or something. And we need to be like, yeah, but where's the like wound? We got to go to the specific, right? right? So we have to get like, no, I can't, we're not going to come up with a thought about your general self-esteem. We're going to look at like the last time you felt shitty about yourself. What was the specific thought you were having in that instance? And we're going to work on that. And then mm-hmm. we're going to do the next one. And over time, that's going to add up. But it's like we build from the ground up. And so with body image, it was like, it's completely overwhelming and impossible to be like, okay, what's the thought I can practice thinking that will like remove all fat phobia and make me feel amazing about my body? Like there isn't one thought to do that, right? Yeah. So I built up. And I didn't even know that's where I was going, right? I was just starting because I created this as I was doing it. So I was just starting with like, wow, I think about how much I hate my body every day all the time. It would be nice if maybe I did that 10% less. What could I try thinking? And so this kind of neutral thought work, I actually really developed in working on my body because that was a place that I was, sorry, I have a hiccup. I was so deeply believing it that... Mm -hmm. It had to be like a baby, baby step. So for instance, one of the thoughts I practiced a lot was um, I had a lot of negative thoughts about my stomach. And so I always say like the positive affirmation that doesn't work would be like, I'm a beautiful goddess, but you don't believe that when you hate your body. Yeah. I practiced constantly like that's a human stomach. Mm-hmm. Lots of people have stomachs like this. Mm-hmm. It's possible that my stomach isn't like you know, the arbiter of my entire worth, <laughs> like whatever it is. Yeah. I did a lot of like, that's a human stomach. And the other thing I did a ton th- that like that thought and, you know, there's one level is working on your thoughts about your body, your body image. The other deeper level is why do you even care? Because you've been told that if your body looked different, you'd always be happy mm-hmm. and life would be rainbows and sunshine all the time. And you would always feel loved and desirable and attractive and you would never feel rejected or sad and everybody would want to have sex with you and everything would be amazing forever. Like that's what we're sold Mm -hmm. about female beauty. And so 
there's the working on your body image, but the deeper question is always, why do you give a shit what your stomach looks like? Like, what have you been told it means yeah. about you or is going to do for you? And so, and I live in Manhattan, which is like, you know, the center of the fashion model industry. <laughs> so like there's, but I, one of the things I love, what I mean, love and hate about Manhattan is, especially when you're young and you live with like 10 roommates, there's no privacy. So people are like living their lives on the street. And when I decided to start looking for evidence that maybe being thin and tall and conventionally pretty didn't make your life perfect, right? Mm -hmm. What I saw was all these beautiful women crying and fighting with their boyfriends on the street or like <laughs> on the phone with their mom upset or whatever, yeah. right? Or, or like you walk past them, they're bitching to each other about their jobs or whatever, right? Yeah. And so I spent a lot of time practicing actually the kind of Buddhist concept, but as a mantra of all beings suffer. And I just practice that thought over. This is why I always laugh that it's like Jewish life coaching. I'm like, life is terrible for everyone sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> but it's true because so much of the, the reason we are all so addicted to the, con to the idea of changing our bodies and finally being thin enough and finally being pretty mm -hmm. enough is that we are sold this complete lie that if we do that, life is always going to feel good. Yeah. And we're always going to feel happy and we're always going to feel loved and we're never going to feel rejected. And women's brains are trained to do that so that the minute you feel, and this is why like you feel sad about yourself and then your brain is like, we should lose weight. That would solve that. Yeah. Right. Like you're yeah. programmed to have your brain tell you that losing weight is a solution to any problem. Mm -hmm. Rejected. Yeah. If we, if we lost weight, if we look different, that wouldn't happen. Right. And so I spent a lot of time and I teach my clients to spend a lot of time. You have got to it's not really undoing that loop because that loop exists now, but we stop strengthening it. We start building a new loop. Mm -hmm. And over time, the new loop becomes the dominant one. The old loop kind of fades away, right? It's like yeah. you stop beating a path through a forest and you start a new path. The old path gets overgrown eventually. Mm -hmm. So I spent those, like those two thoughts, this is a human stomach and all beings suffer. Mm -hmm. I spent like a whole summer practicing those two thoughts. And the, yeah. that was like the beginning. And that should change my life. And then I had lots of other thoughts as I went along. But when I say like, keep it simple and repetition in the beginning, like I really yeah. mean it. I'm, I'm geeking out right now because I recently had Dr. Kristen Neff on the podcast, who's a self-compassion researcher mm -hmm. um, and also an avid uh, Buddhist mm -hmm. studier. Yeah, and she's great. yeah, one of her principles is that common humanity aspect. Yes. Which yeah. Buddhism preaches so much um, of like, we need that thing that unites us. Like this is a human, human stomach, not just your stomach, but right. everybody's, totally. um, and all being suffer. And that is a huge part that so many people skip over. And honestly, until she came on the podcast and now you saying that I, I, it's not like something I think about or can put words right, to. Because it's the antithesis of American society, which is mm -hmm. you should be happy all the time. Yeah. And if you're not, something's gone wrong and it's your fault. So you should change yeah. yourself or buy this thing to make yourself happy. Exactly. It's right. That, All yeah. of that is, that's why that cultural analysis is so important. It's not that other cultures don't have their own problems, right? But yeah, but you just have to know what your culture specific problems are. And one yeah. of America's problems is the idea that we should always be happy. That mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're unhappy, something's gone wrong. Mm -hmm. You need to change it. This is truly why I think being Jewish is helpful because I just didn't grow up with the idea that like everything's <laughs> yeah. always awesome. Like all the holidays are about genocide. Like you just don't, <laughs> You know, there's like a lot of talk about suffering, oh. like, and not, I yeah. think there's better versions. The Buddhist version I find more helpful, but like, I do mm -hmm. think that I was like, I didn't have this idea that like everything always works out perfectly for everybody and we should always be happy and we're not right. And so that, and, but it's such a, it's so damaging because what it means is that whenever you have a completely normal human experience, like feeling sad or feeling lonely or feeling lost mm -hmm. or feeling rejected or whatever else because something happened or just because that's what happened in your brain that day, just because you're a human, that pain is actually not that bad if you can just be with it. But we layer on so much additional suffering of freaking out about how this means something's gone wrong and there's something wrong mm -hmm. with us. And now we have to change something or buy something or drink three bottles of wine to forget it. Or like, <laughs> yeah, all that 90% of the suffering is the drama that we add on top. Mm, yeah. I, I need to hear that a lot. I've been, we all do. I mean, I have to tell myself this a lot, but the <laughs> lie that like being, you know, that being thin is what's going to, and people have different ones. We also tell the lie that money will do this for you. Yeah. If you have enough money, you'll never have to be sad or unhappy again. Like there's no, I would say there's no exit ramp off a human experience. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, by the way, would this be a good time to wish you a happy Yom Kippur? <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. Uh, <laughs> happy New Year. We made it through. I mean, it, I, tw- you know, whatever. I actually don't even know what Jewish year is. 56 something. Anyway, it can't be crazier no than idea. the last one. I have no idea. Like you said, all the family gatherings are about how much we've suffered. <laughs> so I, I don't know. Yeah, Any they're all, they tried to kill us and they didn't succeed. Let's eat. Or they tried yeah. to kill us and they did succeed. So we don't eat. Those are the two. Yeah. Oh, seriously, for sure. (laughs) That's so funny. I can't wait to tell my family that they're going to laugh so hard. Um, One last question that I have for you. I have a a lot of thoughts about everything you said, but I also want people to let that sink in and also go to, I think the episode that we were specifically talking about was 149 on your podcast um, about the the body image and the internalized fat phobia. So I, I want people to go listen to that. Um, but the last question that I have for you here is, I was, I, I listen, obviously I listen to all your podcasts, but this framework that you present about events being neutral, so mm-hmm. something happens and then we attach a certain thought to it and then those thoughts then determine our feelings. Um, and the one thing that's come up for me, so I guess <laughs> this is a little bit of a selfish inquiry. I'm sure it's um, come up for everybody else too then, so. Yeah. I would, I would just love to, and I'm sure you've addressed it too, um, but I would love to hear your take on it, is when it comes to, because you, you do a lot of bridging gaps. That's what I really see you doing so beautifully is bridging gaps. So like um, feminism and the patriarchy and body image and uh, life coaching and thought work and like all these mm-hmm. things. Um, and they're all bridging together. One thing that you've done also so well is bridging the gap between social justice Mm -hmm. and thought work. Um, And so when talking about events being neutral and something happens that is completely unjust, that you always say that your feelings are valid, like it's not, you're experiencing them, so they're real, right? Um, how can we use thought work and apply it to situations of injustice? And I'm, I'm thinking about a lot of racial injustice happening in our country right now, a lot of recent um, jury rulings and things like that. How do we use that in order to like, not only keep our sanity, but also create change um, and speak about these issues? Because I think to me, that's the most important thing is that if I'm drowning in my own like self-pity and Mm. hopelessness and negative thoughts and the world is doom and gloom and coronavirus is never going to end and and all this stuff then then i'm not going to be able to do the work that i that i set out to do which is serve people or have convert productive conversations about these things which are needed now more than ever so yeah so yes so no go ahead you got it i'll I'll give the short i'll give the short version there's we talk about this a lot of the podcast um so the first thing to say is when i say neutral what I mean, it's like always important to clarify what that means because I think people yeah. can hear it in the wrong way. What it means is just that human meaning is made up by human brains, mm-hmm. right? So like a tree doesn't have the same ideas of human justice as we do, mm-hmm. right? We like human philosophers make up and debate I- ideas mm-hmm. about like meaning and justice, right? These are like words that humans made up to communicate ideas that came from human brains that we don't all agree on. So when I say neutral, what I just mean is that is not that um, you should feel nothing about anything that happens. Yeah. What it means is that a human brain thinking thoughts is what gives an event its meaning. We know that has to be the case because people come up with different meanings for different events, right? So, I mean, being Jewish, when I learned this work, of course, I like when, and what every Jewish family member has asked me and would probably ask you if you talked about it this way. It's like, okay, what about the Holocaust? You're saying that's neutral, right? It is not, I am not saying like, yeah, I am pro-genocide. Like, obviously (laughs) I am not pro-Holocaust. I don't think that was great. I would like it to not happen again. I do a lot of work to try to prevent things like that from happening. What it means though is, I think the Holocaust is such a perfect example because we think it was a bad idea. We're Jews. A lot of Nazis thought it was a great idea. It's, two different human brains and sets of human brains having two different ideas, right? About what was happening. So neutral doesn't mean like, I don't think we should have any feelings about the Holocaust or I don't think that we should have an evaluation of whether we think it was great or not or whether we wanna have it happen again. It just means an event happens in the world and then human minds make up the meaning. 
Mm. right? That meaning doesn't exist. Human meaning does not exist outside of human language, which is created by a human brain, right? So given that, we can see that people are going to come up with different meanings based on their different thoughts. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm not a philosophy professor, but I studied a lot of philosophy and I just have never been able to come up with any objective way of proving that my thoughts are more true than somebody else's. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't think that I can prove in some kind of objective sense, the way gravity exists, that I am right about how we should not have the Holocaust and a Nazi is wrong. Now, on a values level, I feel yeah. very secure and solid in my set of values that I have about that and in my work in the world to try to not have more injustice happen. But I just don't believe that I can prove, I can, you know, that I can prove that um, somebody else's thoughts are wrong and mine are right, yeah. right? I can set a couple of some premises, like my premises are, everybody should be treated equally and whatever else, right? And I can make philosophical arguments for why those premises should be accepted. But like fundamentally, it's all human thoughts that humans come up with. And that's why we've had very different societies, very different political systems, very different schools of philosophy, because human brains can come up with very different systems of meaning that make sense to the people inside of them, right? Mm -hmm. So that is like a big explanation though of what I mean when we say like something is neutral and then a human mind gives it meaning. Yes. So. All of that being said, of course, I think we all can, I, would get, I mean, I won't say should, but we can, and I choose to have my own set of values. I just understand that they're subjective, right? Mm -hmm. I just don't believe that they're objective and I'm the one who's tapped into them and everybody who doesn't agree with me is mm -hmm. missing the objective truth, right? I just acknowledge, like, I have a subjective set of values which says that people are equal, right? Racism is bad, police brutality, is racist like I, those are my personal beliefs and values mm -hmm. i can't uh i cannot deny that there are other humans who look at the same situation and have different thoughts so in that context what this work means for me is i see the world i, I forget the name for this um is it political there's a name for this version of political theory where you basically see politics as like groups of competing interest groups who are trying to kind of persuade each other and mm -hmm. argue with each other, right? I mean, that's fundamentally how I see the world. There's lots of different, about anything personal or political. There's lots of different minds having lots of different thoughts about the same thing. And mm -hmm. so if that's the case, what do I want to do? I want to have as much mental and emotional energy as possible to advance my values and my version of how I want things to be. Mm -hmm. That's what I want to do. That's my goal. And so if that's my goal, being out, being sort of, um, what, would be, what would be the way to say this? Like being outraged to the point of incapacity, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of us do. <laughs> and a lot of us sort of take that to be the mark of being a good person, mm. right? We think that like the more outraged we are, that like, that means we're more committed to justice, mm -hmm. even if it means we actually just sit at home in a rage and like text our friends yeah. about how much we hate the president and don't actually do anything, right? Talk like, about performative activism, yeah. Yeah, and I don't, I don't like, I'm not criticizing people for that. I think it's a, um, it's just a, it's just a cultural thing and it's because we don't know that we have a choice, right? Mm -hmm. And because we associate kind of moral outrage with being a good person or with morality. So I don't think like when people are, when people are doing kind of performative activism or virtue signaling, I think that's all coming from a mix of like insecurity and wanting to do the right thing, whatever. We could have a whole separate conversation about that. But um, mm -hmm. when we don't choose how to think and feel on purpose, we are completely reactive, right? Mm -hmm. We're on an emotional roller coaster. And I think we have the misconception, some people, for some people, anger is motivating and, and they are, then they do things with it. But for a lot of people, it isn't, and we just think that it is. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I really teach when people have a political commitment they're trying to live out is, let's not make any assumptions about what thoughts you're thinking and how well they're working. Mm -hmm. Let's really like in, the, in, my, um, in my teaching, excuse me, and in the clutch, I teach a model for looking at how, what results you're getting when you think a certain thought. And so I'm always like, let's plug it in. Let's mm -hmm. see. Are we getting that you like go to that march or you start that new advocacy group or you go yeah. talk to your Uncle Bob and you actually convince him of something? Like, are we getting a result we want mm -hmm. or are we actually just getting a lot of reactive 
outrage followed by emotional exhaustion and buffering to distract mm -hmm. ourselves and then nothing's actually happening. So yeah. I don't make an, a, I don't make a universal claim that anger and outrage doesn't motivate and some people it may. My experience is that a lot of people who think they're motivated by that, if you actually look at the results we're getting out of them, they're not actually doing that much. Right. They're just feeling shitty yeah. and maybe rage posting on Facebook, which mm -hmm. given the way the algorithm works, nobody's seeing that who doesn't already agree with you pretty much. And you're yeah. not changing hearts and minds that way. Yeah. Um, sure. So, and I, you know, and I, we didn't really talk about this in the beginning, but I, my, I would say my credentials for this are coming from, I had a whole career as a social justice lawyer before I was a coach. So. I was in the reproductive rights movement for 15, 20 years. I was a reproductive mm -hmm. rights litigator. Then I was an academic. I did policy work. Like I'm very familiar with social justice burnout, which happens to professionals, much less kind of the amateur social justice workers a lot of us are now. Like mm -hmm. you will burn out if that is what you operate on. It's a huge problem in social justice work. And I think it's because we don't teach people how to deal with the emotional resistance to the world not being the way we want that emotional resistance actually drains us of the energy and power we have to cha actually change the world. That's my experience. Yeah. Right. And when you are very reactive, like you were just saying, you don't go out and do the work you want to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And you have a persuasive conversation with someone in your family when you take everything they say as a personal attack and want to scream at them about how terrible they are. Yeah. This is not, you know, I feel like in this day and age, like it's very, right word. I, I'm trying to be diplomatic. I think social ostracism is one is one tactic for attempting to make social change. I don't think it's that effective. Mm -hmm. It's certainly in my experience doing this work, like what even in we take out politics, even if you're just trying to get yourself to go to the gym, shaming yourself mm -hmm. doesn't work. So yeah. this sort of very adversarial, like if you don't agree with everything that I believe, then you are a fascist and a racist and fuck you forever. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying anyone shouldn't have that point of view if they want to have it. I'm just saying that's not going to change anybody's minds. And mm -hmm. I think we have some, we have different ideas maybe of how changeable people's minds are, how valuable that is. But having spent kind of 20 years in that, like very all or nothing, agree with everything I think, or the highway, if you don't agree with everything, I think you're an enemy of feminism. <laughs> like having yeah. lived in that world, you know, I find now that the, the, the less I, the, I'm paradoxically, the more I am in my own lane focused on the change I want to create and how I need to show up to do that, mm -hmm. the more I get done. Yeah. The more I'm up in everybody else's business about what they think and how they shouldn't think it anymore, the less mm -hmm. I get done in actually changing the world. Yeah. I think, I think what it is for me with thought work, it's like, it really comes down to like, what, what can I do? And it protects my mental health totally. so that- I can actually help more people. Um, and that so that is so important that like I go to therapy and I talk about how to talk to the racist people in my life about this stuff and pick out every word so that I can almost do thought work on them <laughs> where right, I need right, them right. halfway. Try and, to persuade and see what yeah. happens. Right. If you have a hundred units of energy in your brain and you burn 80 of them on being angry that other that the world is the way it is, you only have 20 left to actually try to change it. Yeah, for and sure. So I have a whole episode called What About Sexism, where I talk a lot about this distinction I teach between emotional resistance and political resistance. And we mm -hmm. think you have to be emotionally resisting reality, hating the way things are, thinking they shouldn't be that way, thinking a lot about how terrible it is, being very angry that it is terrible. We think we have to do that to make political change. Mm -hmm. And I actually think that it gets in our way. Oh, that is so key. Emotional resistance versus political, political resistance. resistance. Yeah. We mistake emotional for political resistance. Yeah. And in fact, they're two completely different things. And you can practice political resistance without experiencing emotional resistance. And you will have a mm -hmm. lot more energy to do so. Yeah. One thing I've started doing, um, my, my girlfriend told me that I, I texted her, speaking of hopeless, you just did an episode mm -hmm. of feeling hopeless. I'm like, I feel so hopeless. I don't know what to do. It feels like there's what can we do, right? The question I always get from people is like, what can I do? Okay, you're just complaining, but there's no solution. Um, and so that was something that was very much coming up with me. And she's like, I find that if I at least do something, anything, actual volunteer work for whatever yeah. I believe in, then I sleep peacefully at night knowing that I did what I could instead of just being a keyboard warrior. Totally. Also, um, human brains always want to tell us that they don't know what to do. 
Yeah. But, I mean, there's 600 listicles online of like five things you can do today to help racial justice or to help take back the White House yeah. or whatever. Like you can't, I mean, this is a whole other thing, but like human brains are just, my brain, every time I have to like, like the, my microphone won't work. My brain's like, well, I don't know. I guess we'll just die. There's no way for me to solve this. This like, is how it ends. This is just it. Yeah, <laughs> I can't do it. Anytime I encounter a new skill, my brain is like, no, I can't. I'll just die. Like, this yeah. is just what brains do. And part of a lot of what I teach and what you <laughs> do when you study thought work is like learning how yeah. to not believe all the dumb shit your brain says. Like, I can't figure out what to do. For sure. It's literally the story of my life. <laughs> I know, all of us. But that's what's so hilarious, right? People yeah. look at me and they and they think like, like you have like a managed mind and you feel confident and you have this business and blah, blah, blah. So you must like have a, you must totally manage your mind and not have this. You must feel like you can do anything. And I'm like, are you kidding? Every day my brain is like, no, I hate it. I don't want to do any of it. I don't like it. I hate you. I hate it. I can't do it. I want to die every day. Yeah. yeah last is- week I, I came into my boyfriend's office and I'm like, would we be okay if I stopped working? Cause I think I'm going to quit. <laughs> right. Yeah, we'll day- be fine. I mean, be like, all right no we're not doing that yeah yeah oh that's so funny so relatable totally. <laughs> well, Cara, thank you so much um i think this episode went so many different directions all so very deep and all a lot to digest so i'm going to recommend our listeners uh listen to it pause take notes when they need to and also <laughs> listen to your episodes because they're like 20 ish minutes, which makes it so digestible, very deep dives into specific topics. The one where you really changed my life, by the way, um, was your loneliness episode, mm. which is crazy because I listened to it at the start of the pandemic, because of course we're all feeling very lonely. And I think that episode you posted like at least a year ago. Um, mm, and I was yeah. like scrolling, like looking for it. Your titles, like anytime I need something, because your titles are just so like they say what it is. Mm-hmm. And I'll just click yeah, on they're not I- cute. They're just like, no, this is about feeling lonely. Yeah. Like here, it's like a here. podcast will <laughs> say. That's what yeah, you're there you go. Encyclopedia. <laughs> Encyclopedia of emotions on a podcast. Yeah. Yes. Take what you need. Um, so you have your podcast. Where else can we find you and work with you? Uh, you can find me at unfuckyourbrain.com. And if you go there, you'll also see information about The Clutch, which is my feminist coaching community where we dig into all this stuff in real time. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Cara. Thank you, everybody, for listening. Um, And I'll talk to you guys next week.